Okay. So first of all, I just want to say um, thank you to everybody for giving up your time to come and join this webinar where we're going to be talking about airwave oscillometry and its use in the diagnosis and monitoring of respiratory disease. So my name is Bernie Coleman and I work for Nowis Healthcare, who are the UK distributor for Tremorflow, which is um, a portable um, oscillometer. Um, and I've worked with um, Thoracis to organise um, this webinar um, and Thoracis are the manufacturer. I'd like to say a big thank you to Brian um, Lipworth for agreeing to present. Um, and for those of you that don't know, Brian is a clinical professor at Dundee University, as well as the head um, of the Scottish Centre for Respiratory Research, which is internationally renowned for uh, research excellence in the clinical airway research field. Airwave oscillometry has got broad utility within the respiratory area and crucially it only requires tidal, normal tidal breathing um, and as it has no forced manoeuvre it's actually very easy uh, for patients to use and consequently it's generally very well accepted by patients from preschool age through to the elderly um, as well as those unable to use spirometry. Brian has adopted oscillometry in his routine clinical practice as well as in his research and today he's going to share some of the work that he um, and others have done in airways disease to demonstrate its utility. Before I hand over to him just a couple of things to note. One in terms of, of chat um, and in terms of questions if you have any questions as we're going through as we have over 100 people um, connected on I'd appreciate if you could perhaps send that to me on chat um, and I will um, ask um, those questions um, at the end of the session uh, to minimise distraction. So without much further ado, I will now hand over to Brian. Thank you. Thanks, Bernie. And thank you everybody for taking the time out of your schedule at the end of a, a long working day to, uh, to join the webinar. I hope you enjoy it. So this is the batting order. I'm going to briefly talk about some airways physiology, um, explain to you and demystify the airway oscillometry outcomes, and then I'm going to divide the talk into asthma and COPD and then summarize. So this is a, a, an albeit schematic to show you the uh, uh, 23 generations of the bronchial tree from where the trachea bifurcates at the carina and we tend to divide this into the larger and smaller airways and which are divided after generation eight. And after generation eight, we're talking about airways less than two millimeters um, in caliber. Now you might think, well, they're not important because they're small. But if you think about it, because they divide and divide and divide and divide 23 times, although the small airways are in themselves small in caliber, um, because they keep dividing, the actual overall mucosal surface area is much greater in the small airways from generation eight onwards than in the proximal airways. <clears throat> and it's said that if you compare the relative mucosal surface area from generation eight to 23 to the proximal airways from generation one to eight, that would equate to comparing a beach towel to a tennis court in you know, if you unraveled all the airways. So it is important to consider what's been called the quiet zone in the distal lung. And I'm going to try and explain to you why using um, airway oscillometry is ideal for doing this. So how do you assess the small airways? This is a review that I wrote uh, about six years ago in the Lancet Respiratory Medicine um, on the quiet zone and how to assess the small airways. I'm not gonna go through all the methods. Um, you can get some sort of a handle <clears throat> on small airways by measuring the forced expiratory flow between 25 and 75 percent of forced valve capacity but the problem with that test is that it's very effort and volume dependent and unless you know you've breathed all the way out to residual volume you end up going to underestimate the uh, expiratory flow rate. Then there's tests like nitrogen washout which to be honest are a bit of a faff to do um, and they do require quite a bit of patient cooperation and time and expertise whole body plethysmography going into a body box. Patients don't like that. Um, and then we've got other techniques, obviously, things like bronchoscopy. Um, we're not going to be doing on a routine basis. And then you have imaging, things like high resolution CT scanning, 
and hyperpolarized MRI scanning are more specialist research procedures. So that's why I'm going to focus on impulse oscillometry. And the reason that we adopted it in our clinical practice, so anyone who walks through the door in my clinic gets airway oscillometry um, and spirometry measured routinely. The reason being it only adds a minute or two onto the uh, routine procedure of spirometry. So this is um, a diagram showing you actually what's involved. Here you have the patient with a nose clip holding their cheeks um, and breathing in and out, just normal, quiet, tidal breathing, breathing in and out of the portable tremor flow device. Now what happens is there's a vibrating mesh here um, and that vibrating mesh then transmits sound waves down the bronchial tree. So you basically, you are superimposing the oscillation from the tremor flow onto the patient's normal, quiet, tidal breathing. And it's that measured waveform which then generates what we call the respiratory impedance, which is a relationship of pressure to flow, which I'll show you later the graph that you get out. And the respiratory impedance has two components. It has a component which is what we call in phase, which is resistance, which is exactly what it says on the tin. It's the resistance to airflow. And another phase, which is the outer phase, or if you like the mirror image, which is the compliance or capacitance of the lung, which tells you about the <coughs> elastic recoil of the lung. Now, uh, when you're using this device, when you're using the tremor flow device, um, this is what it looks like. You can see it's very portable. You can move it from room to room. It's hooked up to any laptop. Um, and um, it's very easy to maintain. It's very easy to calibrate. You know, you don't need one of these huge, you know, three liter precision syringes. That's all you need to calibrate it. It's very user friendly for the patient and for the clinician. And crucially, the data is very easy to export um, uh, from the laptop. And that's why we've adopted this machine. We looked at all of the um, airway oscillometry machines and in the end we plumped for this one. So this is what it looks like. This is what you get out. Now, do you remember I said it's a relationship of pressure, which can be centimeters of water or kilopascals, um, to flow in liters per second. Okay, so that's why centimeters per liter per second pressure flow relationship. That's the impedance. And the impedance, as I've said, has two components. R stands for resistance and X stands for reactance. I prefer to call it compliance because I think that's more descriptive. And then the pressure flow relationship, the impedance is then plotted against the frequency. So let's start with the solid line here. Okay, This is the resistance line. And you can see when you plot the resistance line against frequency, there is considerable variation depending on the frequency. So at low frequencies, say at, oops, sorry, not bad. At low frequencies at five hertz, you can see the resistance is proportionally much higher than the resistance at a higher frequency at 20 hertz. And that's because lower frequencies travel further and deeper into the lung and higher frequencies travel a much shorter distance. It's a bit like the sort of the, the uh, radio wave uh, idea of, you know, of long wave and short wave, that kind of thing. So what we have here is the resistance at five hertz tells you about the resistance in the entire lung throughout all of the airways, from the trachea all the way to generation 23, whereas the resistance at 20 hertz, or R20 to abbreviate it, tells you about the resistance in the central airways down to uh, generation eight. So if you subtract total air resistance R5 minus central air resistance R20, you get the R5 minus R20. Central, uh, sorry, total minus central is the peripheral airway resistance. So keep that in mind. The R5, R20 is something you're going to see through the rest of the talk, which is total minus central resistance, peripheral airway resistance. Now, if we then go to look at the interrupted line here, um, this is, if you like, the negative ping or the reflected capacitance wave which comes back. So this is the sort of the ping that comes back. 
due to the elastic recall of the lung. And this is called the reactance, denoted by X. As I said, I prefer to use the term compliance or capacitance because I think it's more descriptive and easier to appreciate than reactance. So this is telling you about the elastic compliance of the lung. This is the reflective wave. Now there are three measures here that you're going to see throughout the rest of the tour, which I'm going to describe to you. First is the reactance or compliance at a low frequency of five hertz. So this tells you about the elasticity or capacitance of the lung in the small airways. Then if you take the line up to where it crosses the zero, this is what's called the resonant frequency. And this is the point at which capacitance and inertia cancel each other out. So this is the line here. So that's the resonant frequency, which you'll see as well. The area under this curve from five hertz to where it crosses the zero line is called the area under the reactance curve. And so that's denoted as AX. So we'll just go with that again. Resistance at five hertz, resistance at 20 hertz, the difference, which is peripheral air resistance, small airway reactance, area under the reactance curve, and the resonant frequency. That's it. There's nothing more complicated than that. All you've got to do is remember those numbers, which I'll remind you as we go through the talk. So don't panic. So here is a patient from my clinic. This happens to be a trace that I published in a review that I wrote with a good friend of mine from Orange County in California, Stan Gallant, who's a pediatric, uh, pediatric allergist. So here's a patient with severe asthma that we got to inhale salbutamol 400 micrograms. So the dark blue is the pre-bronchodilator for resistance. Here's the pre-bronchodilator for reactance. And then this is the post-bronchodilator curve in lighter blue. So you can see here, firstly, if we look at the resistance curve, you can see before the bronchodilator, there's a lot of variation or what we call heterogeneity in resistance according to frequency. In other words, the resistance at five hertz is much greater than the resistance at 20 hertz. But after bronchodilator, that heterogeneity or difference in resistance is much less, you can see. Very little difference at all between five and 20 hertz. Now, if you look at the reactance line, you see the same thing. This is the pre-bronchodilator and this is the post-bronchodilator. So you can see that if you look at, for example, the area under the reactance curve, which is here, this area here, this triangle, is much greater before bronchodilator than it is after bronchodilator. So let's put the scores on the doors. Okay, the reversibility. Well, if you look at the reversibility of the resistance of five hertz, pre and post, there was a 48% difference. There was a 23% difference in the resistance at 20 hertz, which tells you that there's something going on here because the resistance between five and 20 hertz, the peripheral area resistance, was a 75% increase. So you can say that small airways resistance is important in asthma, at least in severe asthma. If you look at reactants, there was a 58% reversibility in small airways capacitance and a 79% change in terms of the area under the curve. So just keep those values there at the front of your mind and compare them, if you will, to what we saw in the same patient with spirometry. We only saw a 16% difference in FEV1. And if you look at forced expiratory flow between 25 and 75% of vital capacity, we saw a 15% change. So you can see the changes are much greater and magnified when you're using airway oscillometry compared to spirometry. And that's the first advantage that I'd like to point out. So what's the relationship between asthma severity and airway oscillometry measures? So this is a study that we published, uh, Peter Williamson, who now works in Perth, um, nine years ago. And we compared healthy volunteers in gray, mild to moderate asthma in red, and severe asthma in blue. So you can see here, as you go from normal to mild to moderate and severe, you get a proportional increase in total air resistance. When you look at central air resistance at 20 hertz, I think this is really telling because there was no change at all. 
So I think this slide teaches beautifully that the most important thing in asthma as you go from normal to mild to moderate to severe is this is a disease of small airways and not of large airways. I think that's a lovely example. Now, if you look at the peripheral resistance between five and 20 hertz, the difference between this and this, you can see that also proportionately increases as well. And if you look at peripheral airway reactance or compliance, that also shows a commensurate change in the negative direction um, as you go from healthy, mild to moderate to severe. Now let's look at a larger cohort because that was fairly small number. So now we've got nearly 400 patients here across British Thoracic Society steps two, three, and four, which are much the same as the genus steps, to be honest. So here we have each of the individual measured values at steps two, three, and four. Here you have the means and confidence intervals within each of those treatment steps. And this interrupted line here at 0.03 kilopascal per liter per second. If you want to convert that to centimeters of water, all you need to do very simply is multiply by 10. So 0.03 is, uh, point, is 0.3 centimeters of water. So here's the FAV1 in, this, in these groups. And you can see the FAV1, even in the step four patients, is you know, pretty well preserved, a mean of 84% predicted. But let's look, for example, at step two. So these patients had a mean FAV1 of 90% predicted, and yet at step two, 65% of patients had a value to the right of this normal line. This line here is the normal value, in other words, the upper 95% confidence interval for healthy volunteers. So all of the values to the right of this line are abnormal, and that's 65% of values. So again, this is telling you something really quite important. It's telling you that airway oscillometry is a lot more sensitive than spirometry. So where you have patients and this is where it's really useful for me in clinic, where you have patients with a preserved FAV1, patients, those same patients, at least 65% <laughs> at step two, will have abnormal values for peripheral airway resistance. So it's useful for diagnosing and following up patients with mild to moderate asthma. Okay, so um, here's a, um, another study where we took um, 442, a different cohort of mild to moderate asthma patients, again across steps two to four. And we found that in this cohort of patients who had a mean FEV1 of 97% predicted, another pretty normal, that 68%, 302 out of those 442 patients, 68% of those patients had an FEV1 greater than 80% predicted. Of those patients who had a preserved FEV1, in other words, that's 68%, in those patients with a preserved FEV1, 45%, in other words, 135 out of those 302 patients have abnormal airway oscillometry in terms of their peripheral airway resistance. So let's dig into that a bit further. What we then did was, is we took those 302 patients who had a preserved FEV1, and you can see their mean inhaled steroid dose was, you know, 800 micrograms a day, 40% were on long acting beta agonist, and we followed them using health informatics over two years in terms of their asthma control. So what we did is we went back a year from the index date when the lung function was measured, and we went forward a year from the index date when the lung function was measured. And what we did is we looked at patients with a peripheral area resistance of greater than 0.7 kilopascals per litre, 0.07, which would equate to 0.7 centimetres of water if you prefer to work. And we looked at patients with an abnormal FEF 25, 2575 of less than 70% predicted. That was our definition of being abnormal. So we compared patients with a high value of R5, R20, greater than 0.07 to less than 0.07, and patients with an FEF less than 70 to greater than 70, 
and we looked at the amount of salbutamol they were using over the two years and the number of oral steroid bursts with prednisone, in other words, exacerbations. And this is what we found. When you look at the FEF 2575, you can see that patients um, with a value of less than 70% predicted had a two-fold increased likelihood of salbutamol use over that two-year period. And by the same token, patients with an R5, R20, more than 0.07 kilopascals, also had an odds ratio of two for, for salbutamol use over that period. And then when you combine the two, you can see the odds ratio steps up to three. So that's why I think you should use spirometry and airway oscillometry in combination. You can't use one or the other in isolation. I think they're both useful together. Now, there is a caveat here, and we can rely on these FEF 2575 values because we were obsessively neurotic about getting patients to breathe out all the way to residual volume. volume. So we knew that these were genuine recordings and they weren't, uh, they weren't uh, uh, under reading their FEF 2575. So that's the caveat. If you're going to use FEF 2575, as I tell my fellows, you have to look at the flow volume loop to ensure that patients breathe all the way out to residual volume, otherwise it's a waste of time. Now, if you look at oral steroid bursts, it's a very similar picture. Um, you can see that the confidence interval for FEF 2575 is just below the unity for odds ratio. That actually wasn't significant, nearly, but not quite. But for R5, R20, that was significant because you can see the bottom end of the confidence interval was greater than unity. And again, you're seeing an odds ratio of nearly two. And when you combine them together for oral steroid bursts, you can see again the odds ratio jumps up. So that's why I think that in the clinic, you can't take one or the other in isolation, you have to use them together. But that clearly teaches you that abnormal airway oscillometry in terms of peripheral airway resistance as R5, R20 is predictive of poor control over a long period of follow-up. And that's the best example I can give you of that actually. Well, what about more severe patients? Because they were mild to moderate. So here we now we've got moderate to severe patients. And these data were generated by my fellow who's uh, now moved to Edinburgh, Sonny Jabal. So what we did here is we looked at the asthma control questionnaire as a surrogate for um, asthma control. And the reason we did that actually is it's been shown that the asthma control questionnaire is actually the strongest single predictor of a future exacerbation, more so than FEV1, FEF, um, um, or uh, for example, eosinophil count, that's the strongest predictor actually. So what we did here is we looked at the ACQ according to the R5, R20, because these were more severe patients, we used a cutoff of more than 0.1 kilopascal per liter, which would be more than one centimeter of water. And you can see if you compare patients with a high peripheral resistance compared to a low peripheral resistance, then they have much worse, to, much worse control. And you can see that the difference between these two values, these are confidence intervals, that that exceeds 0.5, which is the minimal important difference for ACQ. So that's a clinically relevant difference. And if you look at the reactance area, again, more than 0.8 kilopascals, Again, you can see that's highly predictive of um, a worse ACQ score. And again, that difference between a high and a low value is more than the middle important difference. Now, if you look at the FEF 2575, there was no difference at all in ACQ. And although there was a small difference, um, according to F of E1, greater or less than 80%, that wasn't significant. So I think that tells you in severe asthma, that measuring airway oscillometry using the R5, R20 or the AX um, is much closely related to asthma control than using spirometry in severe asthma. Now, if you're still not convinced, um, here's another cohort, which uh, my current fellow, Chris Kuo, published in Annals of Allergy, Asthma and Immunology, 
A smaller cohort, albeit 46, mean F in one 80%, 600 micrograms of inhaled steroid, 65% were taking LABA, 11% LABA, and 40% LTRA. So, you know, more on the moderate end of, of the asthma spectrum. So here we've got our old friend ACQ, and here we've got the AX using a cutoff of less than one and greater than one. And again, you can see that um, the difference in ACQ exceeded the minimum important difference of 0.5. In fact, it's nearly a, a one unit difference, which is big. And you see the same thing here. This is using R519, which is what the tremor flow generates rather than R5R20, but it's virtually the same thing. R5, R19 and R5, R20 are interchangeable. Again, you can see a nearly a one point difference in ACQ. Now you might be thinking, well, how does airway oscillometry relate to type two inflammation? So here we have uh, the eosinophil count, less than or greater than 300 cells per microliter, which is the usual cutoff to denote um, type two inflammation. So if you look at AX, um, you can see there's a big difference in AX between patients with high and low eosinophils. These are asthmatic patients, I should add. Again, um, that's a big difference of almost one unit, which would be uh, through what, 10 centimeters of water if you work in those units. R5, R20, um, again, we're seeing a big difference there, which is significant. And as you'd expect, um, comparing patients with low and high eosinophils, you see a commensurate difference in IgE and a commensurate difference <coughs> in exhaled breath nitric oxide. If you didn't see that, you'd be a bit worried, to be honest with you. So that just validates the cohort, if you like. But I think that does tell you that measuring small airways using the area under the reactance curve, AX, or peripheral airway resistance as R520 or R519, is closely related to type 2 inflammation in asthma. So what happens if you treat patients with inhaled steroid, how do these variables change? So here's a paper where they gave patients HFA betlamethasone, QVAR, um, which has a particle size of about one micron, so small particles, and they compared it to the old fashioned CFC betlamethasone, which has particles in the range of about three to four microns. So coarse particles to extra fine particles. And when they followed up the R5, R20 over three months, you can see the R5, R20 didn't significantly change with the large particle formulation, but it did progressively fall over the three months with the small particle formulation. So when you're positing small particles into the peripheral lung, you can follow by by a commensurate fall in peripheral airway resistance, which was significant. Now, I think that you're seeing there, what, about a 50% fall in peripheral airway resistance. I think that's not just statistically significant. I think that's clinically relevant. So it's a useful way to follow patients in the clinic when you are making changes to treatment. And that's something that I use in my patients. That's why I can't manage without using this in addition to spirometry, not instead of spirometry, but in addition. Now, what about using beta agonists? So here we're comparing uh, different beta agonists, HFA for Motorol. Um, this is Atomos Modulite, which has a particle size again of about one to 1.5 microns, and Salmeterol Discus, or Acuhaler, which has a particle size of about four microns. So you've got two extremes here. And what we did after chronic treatment, these were given um, as add-on therapy to the patient's own inhaled steroid. And then uh, we treated them with repeated dosing for just a week. And then we followed them after the last dose at steady state, chronic dosing. So here you can see that if you're treating, if you follow the red line, which is the small particles, you're getting a much greater percentage fall in uh, total air resistance with the small particle and large particle formulation. And you see the same with R5, R20 peripheral air resistance. So small particles of a long acting beta agonist penetrate further into the lung and drop your peripheral air resistance. And you see the same with the small airway capacitance 
and with the area under the capacitance or the reactance curve. So let's tie that up before we move on to COPD. So what we've shown so far is that resistance and compliance are concordant in asthma. They go in the same direction. Okay. So when resistance falls, um, compliance increases as well. Small airways dysfunction, as you've seen, is common across all asthma severities. So you see this not only in severe asthma, but also in mild to moderate asthma. Small airways dysfunction is uh, related to poor asthma control in terms of steroid use, salbutamol consumption, or the asthma control questionnaire. And the peripheral airway resistance and the area under the reactance curve are sensitive markers of response to treatment with small particle inhalers. Okay, so that's the end of the first part of the talk. Let's move on to look at COPD. So what would we consider to be a typical phenotype of a patient with COPD who's got small airways disease? And most patients with COPD have small airways disease, to be honest. We would expect them to have hyperinflation in terms of an increased total lung capacity. We'd expect them to have evidence of air trapping or gas trapping in terms of an increased residual volume. And when the residual volume goes up, by definition, the vital capacity goes down. We'd expect them to have an increased peripheral resistance and also to have an increased peripheral reactance, either as a, a reduced uh, value of um, reactance at five hertz or an increase in the area under the curve. And if you bothered to do multiple breath nitrogen washout, you'd find that they would have evidence of ventilation heterogeneity in terms of s asin or s -COM. And if you did a high resolution CT scan, you would expect to see an increase in lower attenuation areas as well. So let's have a look at a, a wee case study here. So this is a patient with um, severe COPD <clears throat> where we gave them again inhaled salbutamol. This was a 74 year old man, a heavy smoker, was getting breathless, had reduced air entry in his upper zone, so he probably had some emphysema despite having a normal chest x-ray, had a slightly low oxygen saturation, normal exhaled breath nitric oxide, which you'd expect, and had low eosinophils. Um, when we gave him salbutamol, and we'd see this quite often, what we found was that when you do repeated forced expiratory maneuvers, is that it can actually induce bronchoconstriction. And that's exactly what happened here. If you compare the baseline compared to post salbutamol, you can see the F of E1 fell. So as he did repeated forced expiratory maneuvers, he got expiratory dependent bronchoconstriction. You can see his F of E1 fell and his force fiber capacity fell. But at the same time, you can see that he had a fall in resistance, mostly in R5, rather than R20. You can see that his compliance also changed significantly, and you can see particularly what changed was the area under the reactance scale. So let's put some numbers on that. The total area resistance changed by 35%. The peripheral reactance at 5 hertz changed by 53%, and the biggest change of all was seen in the area under reactance curve. And that's really the key measure in COPD. If you're going to take one measure away in COPD, it's going to be the AX, the area under the reactance curve. That's where you're going to see the greatest signal. Now, how do these measures change according to gold stage? So this is taken. Um, from these data here, in um, you can see what nearly uh, 2,000 patients with COPD. This was taken from the Eclipse cohort, which you may be familiar with. So the first thing you can see is that R5, it doesn't really change much as you go from gold 2 to gold 3 to gold 4. It goes from what, 0 0.5 to 0.55. Um, R20, which is the Central air resistance in large A's, we can see that doesn't change at all. 0.29 plays 0.31. R5, R20, yeah, that goes up a wee bit. 0.15 in gold two to 0.24 in gold four. 
But if we start looking at the compliance or reactants, X, this is where you see the big signal in COPD. So compare goal two to goal four for X, five at five hertz, and that goes from minus 0.21 to minus 0.4. But the biggest change of all is in the area under the reactance curve, AX. That goes from 1.37 to 3.27. And also you can see the resonant frequency also changes quite a bit from 18 hertz to 25 hertz. Let's put some numbers on that. So while the R5, R20 changes by 60% from gold four to gold two, the AX changes by 136%. So there you can see what, what we're appreciating here is there's a bit of discordance between the change in resistance and the change in compliance. Now, this is another way of looking at it. What we did in these COPD patients is we gave them a challenge with a non-selective beta blocker to induce bronchoconstriction. Carvidolol is a non-selective beta blocker. It's a bit like propranolol. So it blocks both beta-1 and beta-2 receptors. And it's a drug used um, to treat patients with heart failure who often have COPD. So that's what we wanted to see what happens. So um, what we did is we evaluated them um, at baseline. And then we evaluated them again. So at baseline, they were taking <coughs> FOSTA, which is betylmethazone formoterol, ICS lava. And then we then added in the carvedilol. And what happens is you can see there was a, <coughs> a small change in F of E1, about a 10% fall in F of E1, when we added in the beta blocker. Um, there was no change in the central area resistance with beta blocker. Um, you can see there was a small change in the total area resistance at R5, a bigger change in the peripheral airway compliance or reactance at five hertz, about a 50% change. And the biggest change of all when we gave them beta blocker on top of, on top of ICS lava was that you had a more than 100% increase in AX, the reactance area. Now then, we're not finished. What we then did was, is we took off the long acting beta agonist. So we continued with the inhaled steroid, but we split off the formoterol. So they continued on steroid and carvedilol without the lava. So let's see what happens when you take away the lava. Not much change in FEV1, no change at all in central area resistance, not much change in total area resistance, not much change in peripheral air resistance, but look at the area under the reactance curve, it shoots up again. So again, this is why I'm telling you that when you're looking at COPD patients, this is where the money is, measuring the reactance area. It's very sensitive to changes in COPD severity, and it's also sensitive to bronchoconstriction. Okay, well, let's look at the opposite now. What happens when you give COPD patients a bronchodilator. So here we have COPD patients at baseline. Then they're given teotropium, which is a long-acting muscarinic antagonist. And then in addition to the teotropium, they're given a long-acting beta agonist. In this case was tulobuterol. So what happens? Well, if you look at total area resistance, R5, it falls with teotropium, and then it falls further when you add in tulobuterol. But look at what happens with central air resistance, R20. A baseline with teotropium, nothing happens. Add in the long-acting beta agonist, still nothing happens. So clearly what this is showing is that if you really want to know what's happening in these patients, you have to measure what's going on in the small airways. And if you look at AX, well, yeah, you've guessed it. This is where you get the biggest signal in COPD. Baseline, a big fall, in response to teotropium and a further fall in response to tulobuterol. So you do get a small change in peripheral air resistance because obviously R5 changed but R20 didn't, but you get the biggest change with the area under the reactance curve. So that's really what, when someone brings me through a reversibility study in COPD, that's what I look at. I'm not interested in the FEV1, I'm more interested in the AX. So let's tie up um, COPD. As you've seen that resistance and compliance are relatively discordant 
in COPD, whereas they are more concordant in asthma. In other words, you get a much greater change in X than you do in R. The large airways uh, measured at 20 hertz for resistance, you've seen that they're, they're really not involved much in COPD, and you certainly don't see a bronchodilator response in response to beta agonist or long-acting muscarinic antagonist in terms of large airways. So what I would say is that lung compliance measured as reactants as the AX is much more sensitive than measuring resistance to either bronchodilatation or bronchoconstriction. So let's just look at a head to head. This is a review that I wrote. You might want to read in respiratory medicine on the utility of uh, measuring um, spirometry and airway oscillometry. So I think this table is useful. So the outputs, you already know what you get in airway oscillometry and spirometry. They both have an excellent signal to noise ratio. I think spirometry is not patient friendly because it's quite hard to do a forced expiratory maneuver, particularly in COPD, breathing out all the way to residual volume. Um, the breathing pattern is measured at tidal normal quiet breathing, and it's a forced expiratory maneuver. Now, how many patients do you see normally in everyday life doing a forced expiratory maneuver, whereas everyone breathes normally at tidal, tidal volume? You can um, distinguish between large and small airways very easily with airway oscillometry, but it's much more difficult to do with spirometry, even measuring FEF 2575. The one advantage that spirometry does have is it's relatively inexpensive in terms of the machine compared to airway oscillometry. Um, they're both portable, at least with the tremor flows portable, and they're both um, uh, regulatory approved by the FDA. So let's finally wrap up. Um, you've seen that airway oscillometry is an effort dependent rapid test, it only takes a couple of minutes, much quicker than spirometry, that you can use to measure resistance and compliance. The tremor flow device is a modern, portable, user-friendly device to measure airway oscillometry. And that's the one that we've gone with. Airway oscillometry is useful to detect small airways dysfunction in asthma patients who've got a preserved FEV1. And that's the case for both the R5R20 and the AX. The AX and the R5R20 are close related to asthma control and also related to type 2 inflammation. Lung compliance is more sensitive than resistance in patients with COPD. And I think airway oscillometry should be used in conjunction with spirometry to fully characterize the physiology of your patients with asthma and COPD. And that's why we do it with everybody who walks through the door in the clinic. So I'll now um, hand you over back to Bernie um, and she can maybe go through any questions which have arisen during the talk. Um, thank, thank you very much, um, Brian, for a, a very interesting talk. Um, we have had quite a few questions come through, as you'd expect. Um, can I ask Leonard if he'd also um, unmute? Um, because it may be that he can pick up some of the questions as well. So. Uh, the first question I've got here is, um, obviously um, oscillometry can be used for obstructive lung disease, but can it also be used with uh, restrictive lung um, conditions as well? Okay, so can it be used in restricted lung disease, interstitial lung disease like idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis? Um, yes, it can. And what you find in patients with restricted lung disease is that the resistance is unchanged because it's, it's not a... It's not a problem of airways disease. It's not a problem of the conducting airways. It's more of a problem <clears throat> of the alveolar compartment. So what you find in patients with interstitial lung disease is the resistance is not changed, but the reactants, so the X5 and the AX, um, is changed in proportional to the severity of the disease. What it won't tell you about, of course, um, is it won't tell you about gas exchange. So for that, you still need to measure um, single breath diffusion, gas transfer as TLCO. But yes, you can follow patients quite easily using AX or X5 in patients with restrictive lung disease. Okay, thank you. Hopefully that's um, answered that question. Um, 
the other question is, does it matter what order you do spirometry and oscillometry? What, what do you do in normal clinical practice? We do oscillometry first because it's a tidal breathing manoeuvre and then we follow that with spirometry. We always do it in that order. Okay, great. Um, a question here about the ERS statement. So what do you think about the cutoff point to consider a bronchi bronchodilator response in the ERS statement? It looks very high. In our clinic, um, we use a 40% uh, change in R5 um, to define a significant bronchodilator response. And we know we've done head-to-head -head studies and we know that a 40% change in R5 is roughly equivalent to about a 20% a change in FAV1. So that's what we use. Okay, thank you. Um, and by the way, the that's, been shown, that's been shown not just for bronchilator. We've validated that for methacholine bronchial challenge test as well. Okay, thank yeah. you. Um, other question here is, um, do you, somebody's asking, should we be using both spirometry, FEF 25 to 75 and oscillometry for asthma follow-up or monitoring drug response? I use both because in many cases you don't get a decent FEF 25 75 unless you know from looking at the um, flow volume curve that the patient has breathed all the way out to residual volume. Otherwise, it will you'll get an underestimation of FEF 25 75. Um, but I but I use both to follow patients. I tend to rely more on um, airway oscillometry now than I do spirometry. And you know, there's about what 20 to 30 percent of patients who just can't perform reliable spirometry, um, whereas they can do um, reliable impulse oscillometry. You know, we're talking about um, patients who do a lot of coughing with a forced expiratory maneuver. So that's where it's really useful. So I use I use both together. Okay. Great, thank you. Uh, they're coming through thick and fast. There's another one here. Um, why is AX increased in asthma? And why does it change with a bronchodilator? Um, I've not come across compliance being affected so much in asthma before. Um, well, we've shown that you get a proportional change in X5 or AX with increasing asthma. And that's data that we've published. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so you will find that the more severe your asthma, uh, the more uh, the the higher the AX and the lower the the lower the X5, um, so it is a it's a really useful measure for following uh, patients with really more severe asthma rather than mild to moderate asthma. Okay, hopefully that answered that one. Um, question here from somebody: Could you please talk about the use of um, oscillometry in post COVID nineteen patients? Can you make uh, a uh, comment on that? Yeah. Or? Um, that's something oh, that we're currently evaluating, um, but um, at the moment um, we don't have any data for you. But it is, but it is. I, I think you're going to, you know, these patients do have impaired <coughs> gas transfer DLCO post COVID, and they do have, uh, they do could, uh, have a reduction in uh, TLC and uh, force fight capacity in the same way that any patient with ILD. Um, so I would expect in those patients that you're going to find that they're going to have normal resistance but abnormal uh, reactance compliance. So these patients are going to have a high AX and a low X5. That's what I would expect to find. In the same way that you would do in any patient who's got ILD um, in terms of idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. I think that's what you're going to find. Okay. Um, one here. How useful is oscillometry in cases with uh, cystic fibrosis? Uh, where there is an airway obstruction caused by secretions and how does it compare with LCI measurements? So lung clearance index. Uh, in cystic fibrosis, <coughs> excuse me, then you do get a disproportionate increase in resistance and particularly R5, R20, as you would in any case of airflow obstruction. I have to say that CF patients aren't my particular area of expertise, but I've read the literature on it and that's what you find. Okay, great, thank you. Um, and it's much easier it's much easier to perform airway oscillometry than it is to perform lung clearance index it's much quicker to do um in patients and so that's why i would probably go with that okay um one question here about um reporting values um absolute versus predicted so what are the normal um are there any adjustments made for for example height and age and ethnicity and if predicted are there any 
grid reference ranges or about reference ranges. So you get you get much higher impedance levels in um, in younger patients than you do in older patients. So it is adjusted for age and heights, and there are predicted values for children. Um, Stan Komarov, who I wrote that paper in Annals with, the first author was Gallant, has published uh, predicted values for kids. Um, I don't actually take much notice of the predicted values. So I see mostly adults rather than kids. So in my clinic, here's, here's the rule of thumb. Um, in my clinic, if I see a patient um, with asthma, <coughs> excuse me, with an R520 value more than 0.1 kilopascal per liter per second, um, I usually take that as being abnormal. Um, and if I see an AX value um, of more than one kilopascal um, uh, per litre, then I take that as being abnormal. So those are my, those are my kind of um, cutoff values that I use. More than, more than 0.1 for R5, R20, or more than one for AX. And that's what I would take as normal. And we know that from you know, looking at you know, hundred, hundreds, uh, hundreds of patients. So those are the, that's my sort of go-to values in adults. And when you're using the tremor flow device anyway, you do have to put all the patient demographics in, like you age, do. weight, etc. So yeah, um, another question here, is there a relationship between oscillometry resistance and time since diagnosis of asthma? Don't know. Pass. Leonard, okay. do you know the answer to that one? I've not seen any data on that. That would be a longitudinal study, I guess. Um, I guess a career asthmatic probably develops over time, but I don't think anybody has done a really long-term study on that. I mean, what we do know <coughs> is that the patients that we see in the clinic who've got error remodeling have really, really high values of AX and really low values of X5, much more so than we see in terms of R5, R20s. That's really when we see the changes in patients who've got established airway remodeling. Yes. No, uh, I, I mean, I've seen single patient data that people have shared with me where you can see some cases with really severe asthma and they don't really respond very much to, to anything. And, and uh, you know, that's just a matter of fact for, for those poor, poor uh, patients. Um, and oftentimes they are a bit older. Um, children again, more anecdotal, seem to have more, much more of a resistance involvement than an AX involvement. Uh, whereas the career asthmatics, they, they tend to have a bit of both. Um, well, the explanation for that is that, is, that, is that kids with asthma haven't had time to develop airway remodeling. That's exactly. Right. And uh, also, um, the, the reactance curve is very sensitive to, to obstruction, meaning that if you lose part of your lung, that's gonna increase the area and the reactance curve because you're now oscillating a smaller lung with the same volume oscillation. That, that's just pure math. So if, if, if you are de-recruiting the lung for whatever reason, AX is gonna shoot up. And that's also very likely the reason that you see AX being so dominant in COPD because they have a lot of peripheral airway closure. Okay, thank you. Um, so the next one, have you studied the inspiratory and expiratory resistance separately? Um, I haven't, but, but other studies have, but that's not something that we do in practice. We just look at the average. Okay. Okay, I think we're getting, I'm just working through, there's quite a few that are quite similar. Um, IOS, is it really different um, to FA, FOT or AO? Um, we've actually done some head-to-head -head studies um, comparing IOS to AOS. Um, when I say AOS, I mean airway oscillometry using the tremor flow. We published, we published those data in lung um, last year. Uh, Chris Kuo was the first author. And we found that there wasn't much difference in, in resistance. We found that the IOS um, tended to have a bias towards a slightly higher resistance, I think it was about a 10% difference in resistance compared to AOS, whereas for reactants, as um, area under the reactants curve, it was the other way around, that the, uh, that the AOS had a higher reactance in terms of a higher AX than the, than the AOS. It doesn't really matter at the end of the day because you're going to be using one device. So if you're serially following up patients, it doesn't really matter whether there's any measurement bias between the two devices because you're not going to switch between one device and the other. Leonard, have you got any comments on that? 
Yeah, I actually done the study myself before joining the company and, and comparing the two. Uh, it's kind of interesting actually, because it turns out that, um, and it was also a study uh, published by uh, Ron Dandurand and uh, a few others last year where they compared, I think, five different devices. And it turns out that the iOS um, tends to, to be less reliable the more severe the patients are in terms of uh, reporting um, uh, correct values. Relative values are probably still okay. But and so, as you said, if you follow the patient with the same device all the time, it likely won't be much of an issue. But uh, the iOS is not as sensitive when you come up to, to higher, um, well, severe patients simply. Yeah, we found that. We found in that paper, the QO paper in Lung, we found that the iOS tended to underread compared to the uh, compared to the iOS device, especially for uh, for compliance. Yes, no, it, it's true that that uh, the the tremor flow tend to be just more precise. No, there's like 20, 25 years difference in engineering time between those devices. So, um, I guess a lot of things have happened and. The engineering skills are just improving and also the way we're interpreting things yeah i mean you know yeah. what i tell my fellows it's like comparing you know an old school carburetor on a car to you know multi-point fuel injection things things have moved on you know yeah. they'll both get you along the road from a to b at the end of the day but it's a different experience no it's a different technique the ios they use the impulses going in which by definition contains a lot of different frequencies you've got a lot of harmonic overlap uh, the design of the device is different from from uh, the more modern devices. So yeah, it's it's to be expected that there should be some differences. Okay, just a couple more questions. We've just got a couple more minutes as well. Um, so question to Brian, are you aware of machines that do both oscillometry and spirometry? No. Well, you could say the master screen, the master screen device has both within it, but you've got to flip from one program to the other, and it's a it's a bit of a pain to be honest with you. So that's why we've we've given up on the master screen. Um, so we just use a separate separate spirometer um, and a separate iOS device. Okay, great, thank yeah. you. The, the the reason is actually that in order to do an oscillometer measurement, you need to have some resistance in the device. Uh, otherwise, you wouldn't be able to deliver the the airwaves to the patient. They would just go out in the atmosphere. Whereas with spirometry, it's the opposite. You want as low as resistance as possible in the device you're exhaling into. So they are mutually just incompatible. But I mean, what I'm saying is the master screen module kit does have IOS and spirometry in it, but you've got to move, you know, yeah. you've got to move from one head to the other. To exactly. Get yeah. So and that, they, that is, that's exactly the reason they designed it that way. They did, yeah. Okay, just a couple more then. Um, one here. Um, is airwave oscillometry considered an aerosol generating procedure? Um, I presume not, as it's tidal breathing. Is the correct answer. Okay. Uh, one here. Sorry, one other one. Should pheno be used before or after um, oscillometry? Um, we do it after oscillometry. Okay. Um, I think, to be honest, scrolling through, I think I've got the majority um, of the questions that came through and um, it is now six o'clock. So I apologize if I have missed anything that anybody has asked, but we will um, collate them at the end. Um, and I just want to say thank you to everybody for attending. We had great attendance there. Um, so appreciate you giving up your time in what's what are generally very busy uh, schedules. And a big thank you to Brian um, for presenting a, a very interesting and hopefully useful um, presentation to everybody. Can I, can I just say one thing before we go, Bernie? Yep. A little plug. Um, if there are any of you out there who are respiratory registrars who are looking for out-of-program training, um, then we will be advertising either tomorrow or Monday a clinical research fellow post, which is actually um, looking at the role of airway oscillometry in asthma severe asthma and COPD. So if that's something you're interested in, Google my name, Brian Lickworth, drop me a line and I'll be happy to chat to you about it.
Okay, th thank you, Brian. And um, again, if anybody would like any um, demonstration or further um, discussions about tremor flow, please contact us. So thank you very much and have a, a nice rest of evening, everybody. Bye for now. Thank you. Do you want me to stay on? Bernie? Yeah, please, uh, please do. Uh, yeah. We're still live, are we? Yeah. As ever, can everyone else hear us still? Yeah. Okay. You want me to sign off or? Um, let, let's sign off and um, we'll connect um, in a minute, yeah? How will we do that? I'll send you something. You'll send me a link. All right. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. See you soon.